It makes absolute sense. Okay. It, but I was about to ask you, like, why? Why is it so important for shamans? Because it is important for me. Yes. I feel it, but uh, I'm always trying to um, find the connection for also the 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 realistic mind, basically. How to explain to my realistic mind what what is that what I feel? But you actually said that it's it's a really important source. Put it this way, ancestrally speaking, we all were tuned into nature. And it's a very modern phenomenon for human beings to separate themselves. And so one of my primary concerns about humans today is the amount of time they spend on the screen. And for me also, because I have so much of my work to be done on the screen, how do I know the clients arrived, they didn't knock on the door, they sent me an email or they sent me a Facebook message. So it's really important to do this and also people will ask questions and then I'm going to give them a reply on that method. So it's essential and useful for modern day shamans and pretty much most people to work with screens. I have a few friends, one he is a builder and he does car boot sales. He doesn't need screens in his life, he really doesn't, but most of us do. So I feel you balance the screen time with the nature time because that's our heritage, that's where we come from. And there is something someone put on Facebook which I very much like, which is to do with if I have a religion or a belief system, if I want to use any of those words which I would not you to use, then it's like my thing is nature and I can prove it because you can go outside and you can see it. It's not like does God exist? You have a question about that. But when it comes to nature, it's obvious. So I can prove God exists. Just go outside, look at the tree. Yes. There was actually a, a religious theory in the ancient Greece, uh, which was, I'm always, I always forget the name exactly. I should have looked up. But it starts with the P, letter P. And Pantheism? Yeah, that's it. Thank yes. you very much. Okay, so all shamans really if they accept it or not, they come from a pantheistic tradition. So as far as the shaman is concerned, the stream has an energy, and so does a river, and so does the sea, and so does a pea plant, so does an oak tree. That's very easy for most people to understand. So all plants are alive, all plants are called a spirit, but so with all the other quarters of nature, a fire has a spirit. However, a car has a spirit, an iPad has a spirit, a phone has a spirit. Now this is a bit more difficult for a lot of people to understand. So let me cue you in a little bit. All these devices, modern or ancient, whether it's like a hammer or an iPad, these devices have been created by humans. And they've been created from source materials, like it might be an ore, it could be a crystal, it could be a rock, it could be a plant material, to make these things made of wood or whatever. So that actually has then been formed into a device for a function. That's giving the beginnings of life. So the question, do human beings create life? Yes, we do. Any human being that's ever created a human, has ever created a computer game has actually known the power of God because that human being has brought a whole reality into existence. Second life, very old game, all the names Call of Duty, whatever you want to think of, that's actually been brought into existence. So that's the power of the gods. Now when it comes to a device like an iPad or a phone, it's really helpful for the human being to send a little bit of attention to that device because that device is in the process of becoming conscious, which is something that a lot of people probably resist the idea of. So that's a shamanic perspective. Everything has consciousness and what we like to do is to give respect. So, for example, would a shaman eat meat? Some shamans do and some shamans don't. The shaman who eats meat is going to give gratitude to that animal. The shaman eats plants is going to give gratitude to those plants. So for us, gratitude is like essential, because it's respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. I have two questions in my mind, because you, you just mentioned now religion center. Yes. I'm reading for my thesis a lot of background literature and this question always comes up is shamanism a religion or something else and uh, I was wondering what do you think is shamanism a religion is the first question you asked that the question you didn't ask is is shamanism a belief system so 
religion. What is religion? Religio. It's two words. It's probably Greek because I don't recognize it from Latin. Religio means to reunite, to bring together, to join up. According to the strict meaning of the word, then I would accept it's a religion. In terms of the general human understanding, I would say it's not a religion. I say it goes way beyond the religion because the thing is, to subscribe to religion, you need to believe this, 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 this. You have to hold these, all these beliefs you need to subscribe to. So I was brought up in the Christian religion and I was taught, I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. I remember the whole thing word perfect and I stopped my intimate connection with that religion when I was 18. It shows how strong these things are. So with shamanism it's pragmatic. I began my training with skepticism. In other words, I did not believe. And yet, despite the skepticism, I discovered by staying in my rational mind that it works but it works, but that worked, but that worked, but that worked. So you don't need to believe for shamanism to work. The client doesn't need to believe for shamanism to work. So on that sense, it kind of falls down. Another thing about shamanism, it's, it predates all religions that I'm aware of. I know that the Hindu religion goes back more than 25,000 years. Most religions we think of, apart from Hinduism, are very new upstart religions. Christianity and Islam, they're terribly new, a couple of thousand years, 13, 1400 years, very, very new. But Hinduism, a good 25,000 years. Shamanism, unbroken traditional worldwide, 40,000 years. So that's a huge difference. Yeah. So before people were able to tune in, okay, I'm being instructed to say something, so I'll simply say it. If we go back to the days of the people who lived in caves, when people lived in caves and they were in, in their cave and they were hungry, then something that they would do is they would get a stick from the fire that was charcoal and they would draw a simple drawing of maybe an animal that could be prey and they would draw arrows or spears sticking at that animal and then the following day they would go out and they would catch an animal and they would kill it and they would have food and they would eat. Now that's an incredibly ancient form of magic. Now we've not brought the word magic into shamanism. Shamanism and magic have got a very strong interconnection. What that person was doing all those times ago was declaring the intention the intention is to feed the tribe. The shaman, the, the person in that time, did a drawing. They activated that intention by so doing, and they went out with unbending intent. I'm going to find me an animal of prey. I'm going to find me an animal of prey. And then they do, and it's killed, and it's eaten. So, very, very powerful. And generally, in the Western world, most of us have forgotten this, except for the successful people. Everyone who has success in business knows all this. All the Richard Bransons in the world, they developed and they manifested their unbending intent to do something. And they didn't let anything stand in their way. And now they are multimillionaires or whatever. So, yeah. But you wouldn't call them shamans? I wouldn't call them shamans, but I would call them magical practitioners, <laughs> even if they didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here's a distinction between magic and shamanism. Shamanism. The way I understand it, and all the people that I know that practice, we are all in it for the healing. And healing for ourselves, healing for other people. So that's what the focus is. Someone comes to me with a need for healing. Now when I say the house needs cleansing, that's a healing, because it's cleansing the space which is going to benefit the person or the people that's going to live there. So for me it's all to do with healing. Here's another example. A person might have a really dodgy relationship with money. If I was to do work with that person and take them guided on the shamanic journey to the spirit of money and they would have the experience of doing the journey and I'd be the guide, then when they connect with the spirit of money and the spirit of money it communicates with them, then they would come back out of that journey with some information. This is also healing because for people to have a connection to the spirit of money means they can manifest their intent more effectively. If the person is stuck in the belief system of poverty, it's more difficult to manifest their intent. So for me, 
working with the spirits of money and the spirits of wealth, working with having a good career, working with love, manifesting love into your life. This is all comes under the category of healing, because I see it all as all as within healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, it, it's among the questions also that what what would be the modern times shaman's task, and you just you just answer that basically. Did I? So your question is, what is the task of the modern shaman? The modern shaman is there, available for those that request assistance. I can remember, whilst I was training, someone coming to this friend's house, and he just spilled out this story. My life was fine. Some years ago, I started to have problems. I became depressed. I got less and less energy. I couldn't function anymore and my life was a total mess. It is a total mess. I'm in a total mess now. I don't know what to do about it. I don't know what it was that caused him to speak to me, but he did. He spoke to me and he said all these things. So I then did a healing for him then and there. He was in the same room as I was in. And what I did is I manifested and activated the blue vortex. And with the spirits of the plants and the other guys I used, we went into his energy body and we drew out all those negative energies and his life has never been the same since. It's like he was totally reborn as far as he was concerned. So people come to you with a problem, usually an intractable problem. Usually they've tried many things, they've been forgotten, they've been here, they've been there and nothing else works. So well, a lot of the time, but not all the time, a lot of the time the shaman is the last port of call for the desperate. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is they've got a problem with, then we can assist. However, there's a really important thing here, which I could just skate over, but I'm being instructed to make this clear. If that client on a really deep soul level doesn't want the work, so supposing they say, yeah, I want this work, but in their heart of hearts they don't want the work, then that can create a block, and it's possible for them not to receive the benefits. If it's possible for us to have a communication about that, that can be resolved, sometimes not. In my entire practice, which has been going on for 11 years now, only two examples I ever get of people who did not want to heal. So, and this was in the days when I was training, so one of these guys came up to me and he said, thank you for your offer to do healing for me. So in other words, I offered him to do the healing. And I said, okay. And so I found myself in a big industrial building and I saw him age two and pretty miserable, pretty upset, really disconnected from everything. And with my guides, I then communicated with his two-year-old, hello there, we're here to help you. We can bring you back to your future self. This two-year-old looked up at us and said, no way. And so, of course, the first thing I did, I said, why not? It's going to be great. You can be reunited to your future self. You won't be here anymore. I said, I'm not going to come back because he's not willing to make any changes in his life whatsoever. And so he wouldn't come back. So I had to say to the guy, sorry, mate, it's not happening. And he's someone who's a good friend, and that really is how he is. He wants to make a change, but doesn't want to make a change. But, like, I've had that twice in 11 years. It's not bad. No. Not at all. <laughs> but did you try again with that person? No. And this is what I've learned. You see, then I was training, and if you're training, one of the most difficult things as a shaman is you're training, or you've just finished your training, you've got these skills. Who is going to want to have a healing from you? Nobody knows you. You're just some person. So to begin, it's necessary to invite other people, to ask them if they would like healing. Now, once you are through your process you don't need to do that anymore so what happens now is i don't offer to people i wait for the people to come to me because that's the right way around really but to start with it's necessary to do this one of the ways i really got a massive training the way i see it is i had my training for two years after my two years i then changed my status from apprentice to journeyman as a journeyman what i did an incredibly lucky situation. I was co-hosting a series of camps for between 100 and 200 people for eight weeks in Gloucestershire and people coming through the doors all the time but we had about 20 people that were helping us to run the camps. So I spoke to one of the people said would you like a healing? 
They said, yeah, they had an amazing experience. They started talking to other people. Could I have one? Could I have one? I did healing for all the people who were actually assistants on that camp. And that was such a training I had because you can imagine how much I learned in that time. Yeah. So let's have one more question before we have a break. So what would you like to ask next? You mentioned the drawings regarding the cave. cave yes. And the first meetup I went to, we actually started with the with the drawing. We did. But that's not that's not how I would. So that's that's for me a little bit of psychotherapeutic method. More. But how how does a shaman? Because it's a it's a little bit of art there. A little bit of art when I hear the drum playing. Shamans are using art as I see, but but is it like is it is it a is it a basic tool tool for shamans? What what do you think? Or does it depend on the shaman, on the person? Right, so the question is about shamanic art and how is art? use as a shaman. So you made a very wide definition, you included the drumming. I'm going to exclude all that and just keep it to the really obvious arty stuff. So in other words, a person has got something and they're putting something on it, maybe a colour or something like that. That kind of thing. It's a vast subject. What you did on that meetup is a divinatory art system which I co-created with my sister a long time ago and we find it very powerful and useful. It's like the person makes their own tarot card and it reveals so much about them. Other ways we use shamanic art, for example, we'll get stones and all the paints and people will paint on the stones. Now this is a huge subject and I do have a film where I take people through my own personal process and I end up doing these three artworks on these three stones and that makes such a transformation in my existence. I face, well I'll tell you, the thing, the main thing I faced was something which is a universal quality amongst people in the West. Self-loathing. Most people are unconsciously carrying a degree of self-loathing with them and I release my self-loathing doing this work with painting on these three stones. So that's just a tiny little example. So there are many ways we can work with art. Something else which I don't do much of and we're going to be doing this on the retreats in Portugal we're going to be doing what we call craft work. People go outside into nature and they get things that they find and they bring them back in a little collection and they use those things to create craft work. That's also very powerful too. So what it is, working with colour, working with form, so anything like painting, uh, sculpture, or just putting things together and making something that's interesting, very powerful shamanic tools which people get huge benefits from. I know, I remember when we were drawing, and you mentioned this, that the people create their own tarot cards. Basically. Yes. So, this is important, I suppose, because of the symbols and, yes. and the meanings, these little crafts yes. I make, for example, in Portugal, uh, they, they represent something. Yes. But how can you use it for healing? Well, I used it for healing for myself because I painted these three stones and I let go of the self-loathing that I was unconsciously carrying with me all my life until I did that piece of healing work. So there's virtually, there's, there's really no limit to the kinds of healing works that can be done by working with shamanic art and divinatory art. It's amazing what you can do. So the other example is when you, yeah, you haven't done this, we did a couple of retreats this year where we did make use of this tool, it's called transformational mandalas. If a person has got, say, a negative attitude to a particular thing, like money, for example, most people don't realize that money is a spirit, it's a consciousness. A lot of people are struggling with lack of money, so in the work to release those old belief systems, the old mindsets, what they do is they get a piece of square paper and they get a black crayon or pencil. And quite quickly, and without looking at what they're doing, they draw this very simple mandala and they put all the negative opinions and views and belief systems about money. They might write words, they might draw shapes. That usually takes no more than four or five minutes. And you're doing this in groups, very, very powerful. Then when you're done, you don't look at it. It's really important to do and not look at what you've done. Roll it up into a cone shape. You go outside and set fire to it and you watch it burning 
and you put it into a safe place for it to finish burning and you keep watching it until the last flames have died out gone you go inside another square piece of paper and you cut the corners off so it looks nice all the colors come out you spend as much time as you like and again you create a mandala I should be more precise a mandala is an artwork where you start in the center with some shape and you add some other shape and some other shape and some other shape it could be purely visual art or it could be words as well and you end up with this piece of art which is your new relationship in this example with the spirit of money it could be a new relationship to health it could be a new relationship to love and I've done these things and they are so powerful so when you've got that done what you can then do is you can put it somewhere where you see it and every time you see it you are simply reconditioning yourself with a new belief systems having abandoned the old belief system really with art the sky's the limit